Thank you so much for the nice introduction. It's my pleasure to be here, especially it's like a field institute, like, oh, almost getting Nobel Prize. I'm kidding. But, uh, <laughs> I had a little story when I was a, uh, when I just get to Waterloo and I thought like, well, what if they're not going to give me tenure? So I come up with a, some, I thought like clever thought. I will tell them I am a charm plug for the Nobel Prize winners because wherever I go, usually people get two Nobel Prizes. That happens at MIT, then it was at NIST. And then in Waterloo, it just like uh, don't I get a Nobel Prize. Says, if you want to get a second one, don't fire me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's a pleasure to be here. And of course, I live kind of not really from far from here, and I never actually visit University of Toronto, which is kind of sad. But luckily, we fixed that today. So today, I I, I will talk mostly about neutrons and um, how we can what can we do with neutrons, even though discovery of neutrons were like quite long time ago, but there was a quite a big progress, at least to my feeling, what happens with the neutrons. And uh, I'm glad that I could be part of kind of going forward with the neutrons and the quantum related thing. Uh, so hopefully, oh yeah, so I can switch the slide. So this is short outline. So I will remind you in case if somebody forget what neutrons are, like very basic things. I will tell you what neutron can see, actually, and I will describe a little bit how neutron interferometer works and how we can use neutron wave function properties, how we can structure the neutron wave function and what can we do with it. Uh, that lead to the structured neutrons and light beams application, which we discovered recently, even something related to the medical thing, which you can see uh, later on. And uh, hopefully in the summary, you will take a message the neutrons are actually cool, not only cold, but also cool. And uh, uh, it should be used for the research in the future. And like there is still big future for it. Okay. In case if nobody traveled outside of Toronto, we allocated, you see, it's like, I guess, Toronto is there and Waterloo is not far from there, but all the experiments which we did here, it's I kind of point in a few places. So University of Waterloo, this is technically a new campus and I'm sitting off site, so I'm not in this fancy building. And the great part of that, we actually, we have a small small building which sits on a vibration isolation. So actually we have a really good vibration isolation, which was based on a, our neutron interferometry facility at NIST, at National Institute of Standard Technology, and they claim it's better, but I, I never checked it yet. So, well, there's no neutron reactor there to be really like precise in doing things. Uh, so you see experiments with the neutrons we were mostly doing at National Institute of Standards and Technology. This is a graded picture because uh, during the, I guess, 2000, like early 2000, NIST went through upgrade. So we have a we have an extra guide hole. Guide hole, it's where you take neutrons outside of the reactor, use quasi like a, um, like a light wave guide. We use a neutron wave guide, take a neutron outside of the reactors and bring them to the instruments. And this way, we will have very low background, and that's important for the interferometry. Um, and you will see maybe hopefully later why. Uh, and of course, uh, maybe you heard there was some problem with the neutron facilities around the world. There was some kind of jinx during the COVID time, but few reactors get closed. And uh, yesterday I heard that the NIST reactor start restarting, which is a uh, great news for the, I guess, world community of people who is doing scattering or material science and anything else because neutrons are important roles in there. Well, during the COVID, we actually went and traveled to the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which also has a nice uh, neutron facility. And uh, we actually did quite good there, at least to my perspective, I thought something wouldn't work, turns out to be, was working quite well. And this is related to the single mode of the, of the neutrons. So inside the water loop, uh, this is building where I sit. So it's kind of small, it's off campus. Um, this is again, right in the center of the University of Waterloo, there is a building which is Institute for Quantum Computing and also this Quantum Nano Center, which has a beautiful nanofab facility. So if anybody needs for it, please um, try to use that. And of course, Perimeter Institutes become famous before even join there. So and that's, I guess, another math place, or at least I say, they claim that they have now experimentalists too. So I don't know. Um, so let's come back to the neutrons. So what do you serve neutrons with? So the neutron is actually, just as a reminder, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a subatomic particles. It's a building block of uh, atomic nucleus. So you know, like it consists, uh, so atomic nuclear consists of neutrons and protons and something else. 
and the neutron itself is two down and one up quark was discovered in 1932 or uh, 35 sorry by James Chadwick uh, no sorry 1932 and in 1935 he get the Nobel Prize which was like a three years afterwards this was kind of the the fast pace you can see like how you can get the Nobel Prize fast uh, and then the there is a, another Nobel Prize which associated with neutron in Canada is actually was leading part of their tool. So you see a Brockhaus and a Schul, Professor Schul in 1994 get a Nobel Prize for the, the discoveries and the buildings of the scattering instruments uh, related to the neutron. So Canada had its first footstep in the neutron facilities and the neutron reactors. It's unfortunate that we kind of lost it in recently because Chuck River reactor was closed. So. I guess the only place now it's a triumph uh, where we can have access to some kind of neutrons. Um, not going further down with that, uh, but kind of connecting it to the light, neutrons also have a spectrum. So the neutrons which we produced in the reactor usually are fast neutrons. For example, NIST facility has a neutrons with a five uh, mega electron volt. So it's a fast neutrons with the speeds very close to the speed of light. But we can cool them down, and we usually cool them down by scattering on a, some light elements like a hydrogen. So that's why we usually have a water, like in the reactor, so you can scatter neutrons when the neutrons lose the kinetic energy. And uh, these neutrons are called thermal neutrons, so uh, neutrons with a temperature of at room temperature. Um, and then um, there is a great rule of two. You can see Enrico Fermi is deriving this formula here. And so for the wavelength, De Broglie wavelengths of the neutron, of the thermal neutron. But I, I learned this rule of twos from Sam Werner, who is one of the fathers of neutron interferometry in the US, who says, well, if you have a neutron with energy of 20 milli electron volt, uh, its wavelengths about two angstroms, and it's moving with a velocity of two kilometers a second. So it's kind of nice rule of two if you want to convert any velocity to energy to uh, technical to temperature because it's a room temperature neutron. Um, this is a good analogy. Uh, of course, the thermal neutron have a unique penetrating ability. So um, a lot of materials, he heavy Z materials with the high Z numbers are transparent for the neutrons. That's why neutrons are great to study materials in particular. Uh, but if you cool them even down further, for example, you can use the, um, it needs to be using hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, you scatter them more. Uh, some people use, uh, you, you create cold neutrons, uh, you can cool them even further down using either by what they call the turbine method at ILL, or you can use uh, rotons in the in 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 helium. Uh, you can cool them down to very low temperatures when the neutrons already don't have enough energy to penetrate this uh, quantum barrier so they cannot tunnel through a lot of materials and you can put them in a plastic bottle and run around with them unfortunately or fortunately i don't know it depends whom you ask a uh, neutron lifetime is about 15 minutes so the free neutrons will decay and you can see neutrons uh, so everything what you see around you is pretty much consists of neutrons and the neutron lifetime is about 15 minutes. So how come we are not decay? I guess we will see by the end of the lecture, we'll see if any of us will decay out of this room, but uh, neutrons not, uh, it's only three neutrons will decay, but inside of course the nucleus, they're quite stable. And um, this is not gonna be part of my talk, but just so you guys know, I mean, we deal with, if, uh, uh, with the free neutrons. So we need to do experiment in 15 minutes. So if you wanna do anything related, but for one neutron at a time. Just to show the power of the neutrons, like, like thermal neutrons, they are transparent. So you see, this is an ordinary picture of the lead cast, like two inch lead cast, and the Asian lily is placed inside of it. So we seal this uh, package and we take an image with the neutrons through the lead. You can see uh, this high Z materials like lead is transparent for the neutrons, but the neutrons still scatter on the on a, you see on the small structures of this Asian lily leaves, uh, you can see through that because neutrons scatter quite heavily on the hydrogen atom, something like, so you can see the water concentrations uh, inside stuff. And of course, if you big lover of the coffee, so you can observe how this uh, coffee machine like mocha coffee is uh, building like kind of the, the brewing coffee for you. This is a picture from a PSI when I was playing, I guess, with the stuff. So, uh, neutron imaging was able to solve a lot of interesting problems for the industry, specifically uh, P 
fuel cell for the for the car industry. And before neutron radiographic imaging, what they did, they have a uh, they have elements which are electrodes are made out of metal, and uh, they need to transport uh, hydrogen to combine it with oxygen, and the water forms, and then they have to take this water out because this membrane has to be moist but not liquid. Uh, and um, before before the neutrons, what they did, they run this battery for a while, and then they freeze to the nitrogen, and then cut it and observe where this water forms and how they can take it out. So they had some ideas, but turns out to be it was completely in the wrong place, and that was shown with a uh, neutron imaging. It's actually at the uh, NIST National Institute of Stardust Facility. Okay, um, now you can see why Superman probably would benefit from the neutron vision compared to the X-ray when he could read the thoughts probably of his girlfriend when she was putting this lead cast to, to hide the thoughts from him. Okay, um, let's move uh, to the interferometry. You see, the neutron interferometry was technically uh, developed 10 years right after the neutron discoveries. And the first neutron interferometer was built uh, on the basis of the biprism interferometer. That there was a few advances, and uh, in 1974, um, Helmut Rauch, uh, here's on the picture, while working with the Bonze, who was doing X-ray interferometry, he thought, well, it's kind of similar wavelengths for the neutrons than for the X-rays. That's why they're a great probe of matter, like an order of a couple of angstroms. Why don't I use similar interferometer for the neutrons and see if we can prove that the neutron is a quantum particle in a sense, yeah? And that's kind of discovery in the building of the quantum mechanics using neutrons and using particles kind of form and start progressing really heavily. And uh, this type of interferometry still survived and still active. Um, you can see here kind of the picture where we have a neutrons coming from the reactor uh, could be split coherently we use for that a Bragg diffraction, which we'll show it later, and then they could be recombined with a middle blade, and you can observe the interference at the detector behind this neutron interferometer. Uh, one more thing, if anybody has any question, please interrupt, let's make it informal, so kind of, uh, yes. What is what? Yeah. Oh, length scale. So this is, you see, like Bureau of Standards, National Bureau of Standards, uh, like the scale, like the ruler, it's on a scale of 10 centimeters. After this, uh, it's in the in, in order of like 10 centimeters. So it's a, again, uh, in, in order to, to, to kind of emphasize the difference between light and the neutrons, uh, we, we technically, we have a beautiful single particle source, quantum source for the neutrons. And the reason for that, it's uh, if you compare it, uh, how many, our nuclear reactor, which is a 20 megawatt reactor produce neutrons, and you uh, it will be, it will be equivalent to the crystal uh, to the to the Christmas light bulb. That's amount of photons Christmas light bulb produced. That will be amount of neutrons, which will be a thermal neutrons uh, with a, with Maxwell Boltzmann distribution produced in the reactor. So we're technically looking at a campfire 50 meters away through the really small slit and doing this uh, interferometry diffractions with the neutrons. So the, so the sources are really just single particle sources. There is no inter interference between two different neutrons because to find them, you probably have to spend a few tens of the years to see the probability of them being a coherent volume. Um, so um, just to show that the neutron interferometry since 1974, just half a year later, there was a first observation that a quantum particle can exhibit, uh, can feel the gravity was done with a neutron interferometer by uh, another person, uh, another person here, the Sam Brunner. So he saw, he kind of said like he thought about doing that, but he put it aside. But when he saw like people demonstrated the neutron interferometry, he quickly ran to machine shop, asked somebody to cut him interferometer. He was working at the time in the University of Michigan uh, uh, Ford reactor. And they, with a Coel Evan Hauser, they showed this uh, Kawa experiment where they show the effect of gravity on a quantum particle. So just to show that the neutron is actually quite a nice or neutron interferometer is diverse tool. It's one of the most precise way to measure neutron coherent scattering length, which is very important for the high energy physics, looking at the low energy background because we do precision measurements there. Um, of course, for material science, because we characterize how the neutron interact with materials very precisely. Uh, neutrons, so that one of the first measurements was to measure the gravity. 
measuring little g with the neutrons, uh, even though this small interferometer, if you think of it in the previous time before the LIGO come up with the gravity waves, we were joking usually, if I have interferometer just this size, it will be as sensitive as this couple of kilometers of LIGO interferometer. I mean, of course, the problem was we didn't have enough flux to actually to do any precise measurements there. Sensitivity is the same, but there's another factor which is actually important. Statistic is very poor. Um, and uh, there was a few other experiments. He also used this color Aronov bomb, something similar to the Aronov bomb effect, but looking at the electric field interactions of the neutrons. Uh, you can see Coriolis force, of course, the rotation. People even joked that to use neutron interferometers on nuclear submarines for the navigation, so you can see where you are location-wise. Uh, so, of course, neutrons is the spin one-half particle, so very similar mass to proton, have also spin one-half, but no charge. So that's why it's unique penetrating ability, but yeah, people use it to study magnetic field, aron of cashew effect, and many other things which I hope I'll show you today. So, again, size of, of about 10 centimeters perfect crystal um, uh, where we have a only single particle at a time so we only have one neutron at a time and technically the another neutron which will satisfy this Bra condition of this perfect crystal was not even produced in the reactor so we really have one neutron at a time interference so um, great for some stuff not great for when people start talking about uh, uh, entanglement between two different particles but um, since I was a student at the Institute, or kind of, I guess, postdoc at the time at Institute for Quantum Computing, we were thinking, well, I mean, we can probably study uh, quantum information science. Specifically, we thought, well, we can maybe advance, like, to see uh, on a on a to correlate at the time of NMR quantum computers with the, with the strong measurements what we have with the neutrons. That was kind of the goal. But then we thought maybe we can use quantum information science to improve this neutron device to, to go backwards, which I hope I will show you later on. In this particular part, uh, people talk about quantum random walk. We thought, well, maybe we can look at the quantum random walk inside the silicon crystal and see if it will recover this very cumbersome and difficult sometimes to use this dynamical diffraction, uh, the, the dynamical diffraction uh, scattering theory of the either X-rays or neutron inside the state crystal. So we apply this simple model when we have a kind of like a building block inside the crystal, which just follow the standard, like a, a couple of rotation matrix as an element. And we apply it as a random walk through the, through the application. It turns out to be, we can recover the standard patterns of the diffraction from a single crystal, uh, what dynamical diffraction, for example, predict. But we also see what's the, what's the densities, currents in, uh, inside the crystals too. So we can observe what happens. And using this model, we technically can introduce many kind of um, defects to the system. We can add dislocations, we can add defects, we can add absorption, which a dynamical diffraction can't really do. So meaning that we can randomly put it and study stuff uh, using this random quantum block, so applying quantum information to even neutron scattering. And you can see we, we quite beautifully predicted old Schull experiments uh, with a theory just just to see how imperfect crystal is to recover like a lot of experimental results. Uh, we used kind of this idea. So technically, if you think of it, uh, you have a you have a uh, you have interference inside the crystals too, and the result of that is usually called uh, pendulosum oscillations. So by if you either changing wavelength or thickness of the crystal you will have an oscillation of intensity exiting this crystal. So it's kind of interferometer where interference happening inside. So we use this, this effect to, um, to do the kind of more strict prediction or, on a, or restriction on a fifth force. Even the small crystal in interference inside, which was published just recently, where it was a kind of big collaboration, but we try to set a bound on a fifth force, uh, which we did with uh, this type of crystal, just to go outside. Um, so I mentioned the neutron interferometer is quite sensitive. Yeah, so it's sensitive, and because it's very sensitive, it's also sensitive to vibrations. So remember, the neutron velocity in order of kilometer a second. So that means uh, even low frequency vibrations, like on order of hertz, is very crucial because neutron transverse through the interferometer in uh, like 50 microseconds. 
So even slow vibrations could be crucial to us. And that's why for the NIST facility, we usually use big massive vibration isolation. So ideally we thought maybe we should move to the grating type of interferometer because you don't need to have this strict uh, alignments. If you think we use a perfect crystal, uh, it's because um, our beam splitters uh, have to be aligned to the sub angstrom precision. So that, in a, if you think on order of like 10, like 10 centimeters or so, that would be quite difficult, especially like if I want to get any statistics, my experiment can last like months, years, depends how precise I want to do that. So you see, to keep it aligned to that precision is almost impossible. That's why we use the nature. That's why we use the single crystal bull, which we cut our blades, our beam splitters out of perfect crystal and the nature does alignment for us. So we don't need to worry about the alignment. That's why you can see this blade somehow still attached to the common base. Well, with the gratings, because the gratings period will be much bigger, so we thought we, we, we can bypass it, but turns out to be for the neutrons, even though most materials transparent to them, but they're also weakly interacting with a lot of materials. So to make a grating with which produce enough phase shift, like pi or pi over two phase shift, you need very high aspect ratio, uh, like etching patterns, which was almost impossible till recently. And of course, idea was also maybe we can shape the neutron wave in such a way that maybe we can use to, to study some particular properties. So here is coming from the light uh, idea that you have a plane waves and if it's passing through this kind of staircase pattern, you, you shape your face profile looks like the uh, uh, looks like a spiral face profile and turns out to be the light which uh, having the spiral face profile will carry orbital angular momentum. So we thought maybe we can do something similar. Um, while I was doing kind of my uh, research assistantship professor and maybe a little bit of postdoc, uh, we come up with a new type of the device, which I was able to build new facility at National Institute of Star and Sound Technology, where we can use to apply quantum information kind of approach to study quantum materials. And that's, that's why I was spending like a lot of time mostly at NIST while doing the uh, professor position there. Okay, so let's move to the, to the why, yes. No, we actually will create the orbital angle. I mean, I will, I will, I will talk just in, in, in a few slides about that. I'm not going to transfer anything from the light, but more like from the matter. I can create the spiral phase plates for the neutrons, which is amazing. Okay, so think of it, you have a neutron interferometer. So these lines, will be representing crystallographic planes. So I use a Bragg diffraction so I can coherently sp split my neutron into coherent path, like, uh, like blue and red or upper and down. So now I creating technically wave function, which is spread over 10 centimeters there. And usually you can place a device like something here, like which will interact with neutron and I measure the phase difference. So intensity coming to the detector per some unit of time, depending on my phase shift, will change because of the sample introduced. So if I have a vibration, even slow frequency vibration, you can think we're very sensitive to this angle of incidence. So if angle of incidence change a little bit, then uh, my neutron will be not satisfied to the next uh, kind of the Bragg diffraction. So it will be just leaving the interferometer and I'm, and I'm losing my contrast. So small vibration, you can even think classically. So you have a moving wall, neutron hits it, and then the, the, the neutron velocity will be modified. And that means it's not gonna be satisfied to interferometer. So I completely kill my contrast. And that's the, the case, in, unfortunately, in our, in our case, that's why we have to build this massive 40 ton vibration isolation table. So you can see here, this neutron facility at NIST, it sits on a separate foundation it's a 40 ton table, which is suspended in the air. And the person who actually invented it is Jeff Green. He got a patent while at NIST at the time, they thought like, who needs that? Like keep the patent for yourself. He was able to send his kids through the college, but now it's pretty much on any electron microscope, a similar idea used to do that. Um, there we also have a second table, which is a couple of ton table. And you can consider this as would be just an optical table uh, per se. But this is the human size, so you see like interferometer, human, so we have really big massive vibration isolation. And because the neutrons, you can think of it as spherical wave, the further you go away from a source, the less intensity of the neutron will end up to be on a small detector. So it's quite far, that's why we can actually see, and that's why it's very important to have a low background measurements. 
Well, it turns out to, to be at the time we can use the decoherence free subspace idea where we can expand the Hilbert space uh, from a two level to the four level and sub, sub select some particular subspace and they build the qubit out of it, which where the noise effect will be exactly similar to the both of this path. And if you compare that to the neutron, so we can think like we expand our standard neutron here, yeah? we add few more blades, and then we will select only pass, which uh, where the effect of the noise for the small vibration will be exactly the same. So the effect of the noise will be canceled out in the sense you, you, you found a uh, decoherence free subspace. So we build interferometer just to check that, and it turns out to be so. Of course, when you make one interferometer, one out of six will work. So you don't want to have two interferometers and say, oh, one of them is good, one of them is bad, maybe because of some other reasons. Yeah. So that's why we build it on the same base. We build it this interferometer by placing the cadmium. Cadmium is a material which absorbs neutrons with very high probability. So, like we can think of it beautifully for the neutrons, we have a, a almost 100% uh, quantum efficiency detectors. And we also can block beams like with a close to 100% efficiency. So we can, by block putting this cadmium, which is just a millimeter thick uh, cadmium uh, piece, placing them in a different location, we can select a different, two different kind of pathways and, and compare them, uh, how, they, how they actually, what the effect of vibrations to them. So you can see this is a standard Maxander interferometer, which we always used before. And uh, introducing the eight hertz vibration, this is a blue line, completely kill the contrast. Contrast one, I mean, I'm changing the phase inside and I see how the oscillations will go with a, related to that phase. And of course, I place these beam, beam blocks in a bit different location. So I'm selecting, some people called it, looks like figure eight interferometer or somebody said it unfolded Sanyak interferometer. Of course, uh, you can come up with anything you want, but even eight hertz vibration didn't really change the contrast, which was amazing. We actually went much further down, but we never glue our interferometer. So it's sitting on a soft, almost like a pool felt. So we, we don't introduce any strain and stresses. And I shake this building so vigorously. So the interferometer starts sliding from this kind of pool panel. And it was about 25 Hertz because I, my way of introducing vibrations turns out to be this vibration isolation system is great. So in order to introduce vibration, I did something not nice. So I put a motor and I put an off shaft mass, which I start rotating when I go to higher frequency, of course the amplitude was going higher too. But the contrast was the same until the interferometer shift out of the interferon uh, out of this perfect position. So the great stuff for that, it means I can build new neutron interferometer facility where I don't need this big massive vibration isolation. So I can just buy a normal optical table, place it on a normal optical table next to the neutron guide. So I have a much higher intensity and uh, I will be insensitive to particular vibrations. And Technically, that was a big achievement, but while working on it, we learned that we can actually do the high aspect ratio grating etching. And we learned it from the, our X-ray colleagues from NIH who is doing X-ray imaging for the medical applications. They were just down the road, we went visit. I saw the gratings, oh, like I calculated in my head that the face should be similar. I asked, can I borrow? And the guy told me no, but I can give you my test from the trash can. So he gave me a few. And we put in a facility, and this is the first image. So using two grating, this is kind of more yeah, interferometry. Um, we do have a, a incident beam, which passing th through two 2.5 mic uh, micron period gratings. Yeah? And uh, we observe the interference at the detector. So this is position sensitive detector. So um, the coherence length is much smaller than that stuff. And the silicon which I have is completely transparent uh, so the, for the neutrons. So any interference you see, it must be through the interference part. This is kind of interferometer in a far field. And then based on this idea, technically this is a wide beam interferometer. So instead of having like, I don't know, a few neutrons per, uh, per, per minute, like maybe thousand neutrons per minute, now I can have a flux of 10 to the 12 neutrons per minute. And that's a game changer for the high precision measurements, for example, for the big G. And that's kind of idea we're building on top of this idea where we will create a different uh, phase gratings uh, when we'll introduce the mass. Uh, and uh, again, if we measure this big G, even like on the order of smaller than atom interferometry or pendulum interferometry do, we have completely different um, 
what's it called? We have completely different uh, systematics here because again, neutrons don't have a charge. So most of this stuff related to the other places, it's a charge sensitive. So we don't have a neutron, don't have a charge. So we're insensitive of, of the coupling uh, related to the charge for the light or anything else. And at the same time, if you think of it, we can also install the X-ray source. X-ray will be affected by gravity differently than the neutron, which have a mass, yeah. So we can have a comparative measurements at the same time. Yes. What is the goal of like putting several spacing uh, like, 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 So, so it? you can think of it. You create a kind of. You need to have a reconstruction to observe the interference. It's like Max Zender interferometer. You think of it. If I just pick one, I only get the diffraction pattern. You will have a diffraction pattern, but you also have to recombine. I mean, you can do quasi similar idea if you have a diffraction pattern, yeah. And uh, assumably, if you put some gradient, but you will you will see the shift of the dif uh, diffraction grating, but you wouldn't measure the phase like that precisely. So because um, we use another grating to do that uh, phase recovery. So instead of intensity measurements, you do the phase measurements. It's similar. You have one grating, or you have a Maxander interferometer. So for some experiment, maybe it's ideal. You can, for example, measure spectroscopy with it. Yeah. You have a camera and go further, but um, if you have a three grating, you have a pretty much the Maxander interferometer. Okay, uh, so, like, okay, so why is it similar to a mechanism or a mechanism from this path that is two paths? But here you have a lot of phase gratings. Just two phase gratings, yeah, a three phase grating. This is like we can think of the increasing the flux by using the what we call it um, source grating, which will match with the period. So this interferometer become in so the period of this interferometer a detector become wavelength independent of course with a single grating you will have a as you couldn't use the white beam because the period will be different uh, this is the moria type of interferometer where the period will be exactly the same for all the wavelengths so you kind of make it at the white beam interferometer you mentioned the phase so is it that phase induced by one of the gradients uh, the phase induced by, like, basically, you see the shift of the phase introduced by the some kind of potential you introduce there. Like that could be, for example, the the source mass. Uh, people do that for electrical fields. So, for example, uh, Alex Corning is using it to see the charge radius for the I don't know for the proton or something else, electron. Yeah. I mean, this is the idea of interferometer. We can talk more about it, but this is kind of uh, needs to get this funding. Uh, so we're building this setup. Unfortunately, there was no neutron, so we couldn't test, but we went in a few places to, to do this test independently. Um, and that's coming to the kind of starting with the structure to, to have a grating. You can think of it because, again, this is not absorption grating, which I was talking about. This is a phase grating. So they're completely transparent for the neutron. The only which you simulate, it's a phase profile, yeah? Uh, and then thinking of that, well, if we can do it phase grating interferometry, we can actually change the neutron wave function phase. And uh, why it's important? Well, uh, that's come from the light. Again, it's a relatively young field of orbital angular momentum for the light beams. Uh, idea that uh, you can have a helical profiles. If you have this type of profiles, if the beam of light will propagate, it will have some kind of donut shape structure. So it's propagate creating a rings and depending on the helicity of your waves, you can have a different uh, orbital angular momentum, which would be like kind of similar to the operator of orbital angular momentum. So you're creating quantization in a, in a phase in a sense for the beam. Uh, these beams learn, um, the, you can differentiate it from a SEM, which means a spin angular momentum. So if you shine, for example, this light on a kind of biofringent particle, this particle will start twisting around the center of the beam of the light. If you shine it with a OEM beam, you're kind of transferring orbital angular momentum to the particle, and you can see the particle start to rotate around the center of the beam, but not around the center of itself. So this is kind of differentiation. And it found a lot of applications already. So people use it for the communication with a high bit rate, like terabit operations. They use it as a tweezers, optical tweezers. Uh, there is like zillions of application already, even though it's quite young field for the for the for the light. Um, I was I was late on one of the talks, which was given by the um, 
but Ben McMoran, at least he was doing something similar, but with the electrons. So and because I guess I was late, I didn't really thought it was too hard. So I, I was hearing what he was saying about creating uh, orbital angular momentum by the light passing through this uh, spiral face plate. And I was just playing with similar stuff with the prism inside the interferometer. So I thought, oh, why don't I make this type of the face plate and see what will happen to the neutron? Yes, please. How, how that, what is the how they're we will we will get to that. Yeah, just in a second. Yeah. It's coupling to the light will be very weak. Well, weak depends on the scale. Yeah, it still have a moment, magnetic moment. Yeah, but uh, no, we're not coupling it to the light. That's true. Okay, so and you can see this is I, I stole it from one of the review articles on the. Kind of lifespan of this orbital angle momentum uh, field for the light, and you see like lifespan. Um, and I guess around 2011, I heard this talk. Uh, it's not of this paper, but of science paper uh, for the electrons. And uh, you see in 2015, we published paper in Nature for the for the for the neutron. And uh, you can see next to us, this is a paper from Anton Zeilinger when he created a orbital angle momentum beam of light with a very high uh, uh, L. So like. 10,000, I think, L, which was kind of cool and great. Uh, and uh, I, you will see why I mentioned that. Uh, not because Zanninger get a Nobel Prize. Um, so nowadays, well, people can easily create this, like a variety of these weird shape beams profiles for the light. And they just use this spiral face, uh, sorry, the sp spatial light modulator. So you, it's almost like a computer screen. You generate anything you want, you, you, and you reflect light from it. So you can create like pretty much a like variety of these different type of the beams. Unfortunately, we don't have it for the neutrons. Uh, but uh, it's very difficult to create the spiral face plate for the light because you think of it, you need to do deposit on a scale of few nanometers, the step sizes. Well, I mentioned that the neutrons are most, most materials transparent for the neutrons. So uh, not only transparent, but interaction is actually quite weak. So we were able to make this spiral face plate for out of aluminum for the neutron, where the step size to create a two pi jump was on a scale of 112 microns. So you see, we can use the ordinary machining tools uh, to create something like spiral face plates for the neutron compared to the for the light when they have to do like optical lithography etching and it's like not easy to do. So we're able to create this spiral face place for the neutron uh, where like if you go around its center kind of like a staircase so your neutron will pick up a phase and idea that when you get to that place that you will have exactly two pi phase jump. So you're kind of creating like uh, like circular boundary conditions for the wave for the wave function. So uh, one more thing to differentiate for the light, the neutron index of refraction of the most materials, it's deviate from one by 10 to the minus six. So it's very weak interaction. That's why we need to have like 112 microns to pick up a two pi phase shift because of this like small number. And uh, ideally you can find materials where the sign is actually changed. So it could be above one or below one, depending on the interaction of the neutron with the materials. So we have extra kind of feature for the neutrons. Um, okay, so turns out to be if I would be smart enough, I would be able to publish at the same time paper what Zeninger published, because my spiral face plate does exactly that for the light. Like you, I mean, it's kind of similar. So if I shine a laser, that was just a laser pointer reflected to the wall, propagated this create orbital angular momentum for the light of like a two or three thousand. Um, well, I wasn't so. Uh, so I, I was I was stuck with the neutrons, and you can see. So I, if I place the spiral phase plate inside the neutron interferometer, so I create a phase difference between two paths. And if I place the position sensitive detector, so I can recover this phase profile. So I basically measure. I use my neutron interferometer as a phase device, something which measures the phase distribution inside the beam. And you can see if I put a different spiral phase plate, so that corresponding L equals one, L equals two, so L equals four. We even did some simple math. When I have a L equals one, I added L equals two. It was similar to the L equals three. So we proved that one plus two equals three. Great with the neutrons and a lot of uh, kind of power of 20 megawatt power of the neutrons. 
Okay. Um, again, because I was playing with the prism at the same time, by accident, I left one of the prism inside. I was doing experiments. So the collection of the data is very, very difficult because I have to collect almost over the week this to co collect this intensity profile. So I need to make sure that my setup is super stable. Uh, and of course, that's why the discovery was not that fast. So I had to wait a few days to see, but turns out to be when I have also prism, it looks like this uh, fork dislocation grating uh, picture when I have a spiral face plate. And uh, so then it's kind of come up that, look, we actually can do this holography with the neutrons of any sample. So that was the sample and that the hologram of the, of the sample you should can do. And uh, so we published like small optic paper. It turns out to be it was top 10 of IPS newsmakers. Like what? You can do neutron holography. Um, okay. Uh, so coming back, remember I mentioned the neutron also have a spin, spin degree of freedom. And we can manipulate the spin degree of freedom with the magnets. So we thought, well, maybe we can use this. You, you're complaining about light interaction with, uh, with the neutrons, but technically we can create the gradient fields. And if we know how to do it properly, we can transfer this uh, phase profile, which we need for orbital angular momentum from the uh, from rotations of the neutron spin. And the idea come really just, you create some kind of the magnet of course, you need to know how many coils and what the current will be in the different places. So it looks like a quadrupole. And this quadrupole operator, it looks like it's a coupling uh, orbital angular momentum. So it looks like a raising operator for orbital angular momentum coupled with a spin and, uh, and a lowering uh, and a spin down state. So what we create, if you send a neutron beam, uh, like specifically oriented, so if the polarization was along the propagation axis passing through this type of the quadrupole, I will have this type of the distribution. And this distribution basically operating with this operator on that, it will create me um, orbital angular momentum L equals one if I post select on one particular spin state. So that was great. So we were excited. We decided to build this magnet and do the test. Turns out to be it's not that easy and we have to make it almost small beam. So again, intensity is quite low, but then, uh, uh, so like by sending this neutron through, if you select on a particular state, like up and down, so you will have out a uniform phase or the spiral phase plate. And then of course you will have a two different beams. One with a uniform phase here and then you will have an extra so it's not because of propagation, but because of the spin orientation, we have this donor shape structure uh, with a wave function applied there. Well, it turns out to be, it's not that easy to do this uh, quadrupole magnets, arrange them in place, but it turns out to be, it's much easier if you think of it of the Suzuki Trotten expansion. Yeah, so we do approximation to this quadrupole operator with the Suzuki Trotten expansion. When, uh, when you kind of look at a, almost creating a two magnetic prisms and you like putting one after another. So neutron go from one and through another. So this is this type of operator. And of course, if you have many of this prism, technically in the limit of infinity, you need to get to recover this uh, quadrupole operator. So we were excited. We said, let's do approximation. Let's put one or two of these magnets and see what's going to happen. And this is the experiment which we did. So we had a couple of like, what we called two prism sets, two, uh, uh, I guess, lattice orbital vortices prism pairs. So um, an idea was to create just one orbital angular momentum, but because we have a gradient kind of field, you can think of the neutron passing through the gradient. So eventually it will be two pi periodic too, yeah? So the side effect of that turns out to be, we, we created not just one orbital angular momentum beam, but a lattice of this orbital angular momentum beams. So you see by passing just from a one through one magnet. So we have a beam, which we polarize with a helium three polarizer. So it will uh, only passing neutrons with a one particular direction and passing through this uh, gradient coil. So we're creating a spin rotation. And this spin rotation, if you do projection uh, on a particular spin state, you will have this almost like a grating made it with a, with a magnetic field. If you pass it through the second prism, which is perpendicular, you will see you create like a checkerboard pattern. While adding another prism pair, you will recover this donut shaped structures. And this is what we did experimentally. So this is, of course, this is the numerical simulation of this experiment. Not as beautiful, but uh, we didn't really have much time to collect enough statistics. So, but uh, we were able to do that. And now people at, um, 
Indiana, they try to use this apparatus to study a lot of uh, topological materials because they, fortunately, they have these special prisms which have a very high magnetic field gradient coils. For the other experiment, I think they published paper on entanglement, uh, which was done at ISIS with a neutron. And they want to use now the, sets, the same sets of prisms to create a spectrometer of, for example, orbital states or something else for the, uh, for when passing through the materials. Um, it turns out to be also that there is an isomorphism be, 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 between the um, Bloch sphere and the Poincaré sphere. So the neutron, even though it's one half particle, uh, we will still have a two spin states for the light. Uh, so that idea come up that we can, when we do have neutrons, we can kind of do the simulations with the light. And we did it with the uh, sets of this prism, which was biofringent materials for the light compared to the magnetic materials for the neutrons. And that was our first paper uh, on optics, yeah. Uh, so where we were able to recover much more interesting kind of patterns with the optical just prism. And of course, we were building interferometer, how we know how to do it for the neutrons, which most people who do optics probably will complain, why did you do it that way? Um, so, and of course, if you try to measure like passing through interferometer, you can recover phase and you can see this recover phase, like it's almost like a holography, which I mentioned, you have this fork dislocation periodically reappearing through this, through the structure. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna kind of start coming to conclusion. So the idea that we expanded it to the single photons too, and it turns out to be, you can start observing the Talbot effect if you propagate this periodic structure, if you propagate further and further, you start observing Talbot carpet. We did it with the single photons. And of course, there is a difference if you have this uh, lattice of orbital angular momentum beams, when just the, the one which would be just coming from intensity. So you see these pictures are completely different if you have orbital angular momentum or not. So you, technically you can measure that using the Talbot carpet. And uh, we did also the state preparation, which we show like, uh, I guess it was one of the early papers where we can use the full camera image to see how, how much of the single photon was entangled through this whole set of the camera lens. So this, like as long as your bell state fidelity goes above 0.5, then you say it's this, this was about 50% of the area was entangled. We did it at the Kevin Rush and Thomas Genovine group before, but while we were talking about that with some people outside of our field, we get stumbled on person who is doing optics for the eyes. And we learned that the humans actually have a perception uh, of polarization. So humans can see the polarization of the blue light, which was quite interesting. So we have a radial filter for the blue light. And uh, so uh, there is a phenomenon called Habinger brush. So if you look at a linear polarized light, you start observing some kind of the big structure of the Habinger brush. So it's looked like a bow tie of yellow and bluish color. Of course, if you stare it for more than a couple of seconds, this picture disappears because we have a retinal adaptation. So we don't see it if it's some structure sees for a while. And Plaxo looks vague. So sometimes you're thinking something in my eye, let me clear it. Uh, but using this phenomena, we build the apparatus where we can send this uh, spin orbit couple beams to the human eye and try to kind of measure and optically, um, if, if you can still see polarization or not, because there was a big coupling between seeing this polarized light and the early sign of macular degeneration. And for us, it's kind of ideal because it's a radial filter. So it will be beautifully distinguished between different orbital angular momentum beams. So based on that, we do collaboration and try to do the studies which we published uh, in PNAS. And uh, super proud to say that Michael Berry was our editor who actually agreed with us. So. Um, okay, um, back to the neutrons, kind of uh, going through. In the recent, just in a, a, a half a year ago, we were using the same idea what people do for the light nowadays or for the neutrons. So we try to create this fork dislocation grating, send a neutron beam and create orbital angular momentum state of the neutron. And that will be pure state if you would be able to do that. It turns out to be for us intensity is so low. So we need to have a grating on the size of the like, less than a micron. And um, so it means if you send just like, there will be almost no neutrons in that area. So the density is so low. So that's why we replicated to like several millions of these gratings using nanofabrication. And idea if you're measuring in the far field, all this, uh, uh, all these beams from a different gratings will merge to the same beautiful pattern. 
and that's what we're using sans instrument so this is just a typical dimension so you see it's a two micron period so we make sure that our coherence length of the neutron was on a scale of one micron so that's why we want to have no kind of correlations in between but we create the 6.2 millions of these patterns so we put it in the neutron beam uh, you can see it's also like even though it was high enough aspect ratio it was still low so the phase produced for the neutron passing through it it's quite big so it means it's only a small fraction of the neutron will be diffracted because of this grating but the beauty part any neutrons which will be diffracted so this this uh this pattern will merge into one on a camera so you can see here this is the the image collective image from many of these of course neutrons scattered from these millions of gratings so that formed the pattern and it shows that the neutron at the detector the size of the neutron wave packets on a scale of 10 centimeters which is crazy i thought it's not going to work but luckily for us it did work so i guess i i mean we of course modified you can create different q equals three q equals seven and of course the ring size also grow and it grows accordingly to the standard equations and uh, yeah so that was published at the science advances recently and I kind of conclude technically we can use this advantage of creating different type of the pattern so ideally we can create for example uh, many different type of the beams we can create like uh, the self-accelerating beams uh, beams which uh, like kind of avoid the obstacles and we can do that in a similar pattern with for the neutrons not only for the life of people created okay um, in conclusion why we were doing all of it so idea was try to use this new type of instruments which has particular structures of the wave function to interact with the modern topological materials like quantum materials which could be used in the next generation of quantum computers um again i try to talk with a lot of people who make these samples i'm not uh, uh i cannot make samples myself but everybody promised samples and actually never delivered but I, luckily i get a student melissa she was from mcmaster institute and she had some experience on growing she said she can grow some samples so she made this sample which is a room temperature uh skirmonic materials which we saw published in some papers so we repeat these measurements and it turns out to be this material has a lot of interesting structures and features so you can see how this kermions forms how they merge how they kind of disappear um, uh, using these materials and using sans apparatus we can measure the small angle scattering like the effect of after scattering and while working with the gratings it turns out to be we can with a small manipulation we actually can recover the face from sans imaging which most people don't care about and doing so we were able to do the 3d reconstruction of this kermionic materials i will kind of skip through that how we do it but we observe this type of the skermions uh, in the bulk material yeah so anything you see before it's usually surface pro here we can see this formation or maybe like an annihilation of type of different skirm materials inside the material using the neutrons and then uh, again i would like to thank my collaborators um, so you can see people in IQC, students and postdocs uh, work closely with the David Corey group uh, on the neutron interferometer in particular. We're trying to make a very beautiful neutron interferometer. People at NIST, some of them are doing neutron research, some of them are not. Um, and uh, we did some collaboration with Ulich. It's another place where we can try to use neutrons. Unfortunately, there is no more neutrons there for another long time. And recently, Oak Ridge. And this is people from the School of Atometry and Vision Science, which we're kind of collaborating and building apparatus. So they do the, a lot of testings with the people now for the early detection of macular degeneration. Thank you very much. If you have any more questions, I'm happy to answer. I have like a thousand more slides there. So if anybody have a question.